You know what's so cool about this program? We have all kinds of people call in and all kinds of guests. We have everybody from uh, Congressman Farenthal, who was just on, to, to Americans, ordinary patriotic Americans, and, and uh, everybody in between. And we have got a guy. Now we're going to go to the end of the spectrum where, you know, the brainy people go. All right, I, Stanford. I, 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 <laughs> yeah, I don't think they get a whole lot brainier than a scientist and a so, uh, assistant professor from Stanford University. Mm, but no. as I buy feed and as I go to the feed store and the grocery store, yeah, I, I buy look feed at, for myself. It's going. I up. look at the prices. I, I see that the 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 size mm-hmm. of not only is the price going up at the grocery store, but the the containers are getting smaller. Yeah, and then you learn that that uh, this huge amount of the country is in a drought. And you kind of kind of makes what you about worry. Sixty four percent right now, isn't it? Yep, something like yep. that. Yep. I just saw a story. In fact, that's why we have contacted. Get this. He is the assistant professor at Stanford University School of Earth Sciences and Woods Institute for the Environment. Wow. That's a long, long his name. Card is huge. But his name is Professor Noah Diffenbaugh, and he's going to try to help us understand, maybe from a scientist point of view, what he's seeing with this climate change deal. Good morning to you. Uh, thanks for having me on. Well, we we would like you to uh, don't talk above our head, you know. <laughs> well, it's too late. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning is a little bit tough. Yeah. T- t- tell us, if you would, Professor, about um, what you do and what you're seeing in terms of climate change and, and agriculture, corn prices, and so on and so forth. Well, you know, we're we're trying to understand, um, you know, how the world works, and you know, we we're we're trying to understand how how climate affects what we do as people on a day-to-day basis. And, um, you know, we're certainly seeing this year in the United States um, some, some interesting uh, effects from, from climate. Uh, you know, a, lot of the, a lot of the country had a very warm spring with a, uh, a, a huge number of record temperatures in March. Uh, and now a lot of the country is having a very hot, dry summer. Uh, and and we're seeing you know the, the, on the ground that that's affecting uh, agriculture, particularly corn, but also also livestock and other crops. And um, you know in our in our research group, we're trying to understand how how the these these extreme events uh, in the climate system uh, affect us right here and now. And we're also trying to understand how climate change could could impact us in the future. Now it's probably too late for this summer. If, even if we do get uh, a wet next couple of weeks, the crops are already they're in, they're done. The damage is done, right? Yeah. So it's uh, you know there there is some nuance, um, and and you know the the fact that we did have a warm spring uh, in much of the country played a role because you know people were really looking forward to a bumper crop uh, and really planted you know record record. Uh, uh, area of corn planted in the United States, um, and and that uh, potentially created more vulnerability to to this very hot, dry summer. So you know once once the plants are in the ground, they start growing, and if if the heat hits, you know severe heat uh, like we've had this year hits, uh, you know during the wrong time of that development of the plants, then it can be very damaging, and we're certainly seeing in in a lot of areas of the country, the very, very big hits to to the corn yields, and and that's already being reflected in uh, record high corn prices, and and uh, a lot of people are expecting that those high corn prices will will make their way through to the other products that that rely on corn, including animal feed. Professor Diffenbaugh, is it the temperature that's hurting the corn crop, or is it the lack of rain, or both? Well, they're certainly related, and that's a lot of what uh, we focus on is how how the the rainfall and the kind of the weather systems that create the rain, rainfall uh, interact with the temperature. So, really, the you know there is uh, there are a lot of physiological effects associated, you know, that come from that from that severe heat. And uh, if there is a lack of rainfall, then that can exacerbate. Uh, the severe heat because the soils dry out that stresses the plants and it uh, it means that there's less water being evaporated from the soils into the atmosphere and uh, scientists call that a positive feedback where one effect amplifies uh, the the original effect that was causing it uh, so so we certainly uh, in the case of the corn belt in the in the United States there's there's a lot of coupling we call it a lot of interaction between uh, the rainfall and the temperature. Is it? Uh, did I read right that 
a lot of corn is going to now, or they're looking at corn moving uh, the, the latitude, if you will, instead of growing it so much in, in where it's been growing, it's now it's moving up towards Canada? Well, that's that's a, uh, a result that we published this spring where we were looking, uh, trying to ask the question if we see another, um, if we see a, a, about as much global warming as we've already had, uh, if, if, if we see that again over the next three decades or so, uh, where will the temperature uh, that we currently see in the Corn Belt, where will that potentially move? Um, so we're not, we're not arguing that, that the Corn Belt is necessarily going to move, but we do expect that, um, that with global warming that the temperature in, in the Corn Belt of the United States will change, and we're trying to understand how it will change, and our analysis so far suggests that these kinds of events that we're seeing right now in terms of, of the severe uh, heat and drought that's going on right now, that that, uh, that severe heat will increase likely uh, over the over the Corn Belt. And, and if we look to other areas of the country, uh, we find that the climate that currently exists in the Corn Belt uh, moves towards the Canadian border. So if the, if corn begins being grown further north, what do the farmers do that have been growing right, the corn yeah. that now can't do it? What are, are there other crops that are more heat tolerant? What what can they do? Well, so that's going to be that's going to be determined by by the choices that farmers make and the ingenuity of of farmers and also of, of seed breeders. And there certainly are a, a lot of people who are working hard to try to breed more heat tolerant, uh, drought tolerant corn varieties, um, and we've identified in our paper uh, specific temperature thresholds uh, that that would likely need to be met uh, in terms of that heat tolerance uh, with with climate change. Um, so, you know, I'm not, I'm certainly not arguing that, that there won't be any corn in the Corn Belt and there'll be a whole lot of corn in Alberta, um, but uh, we, we, we should expect that, that the climate uh, will change. It has been changing, and and the Corn Belt actually has been um, has been changing less than a lot of parts of the country. So there's been there's been some um, uh, the farmers have been helped a bit uh, right. by some of the variability in the climate system. But I, I think I think we're much more likely to see um, you know a redistribution of yields. You know, really the 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 corn production in the U.S. is really and uh, really highly concentrated in the Corn Belt. And you know what we may see with this is a decrease in yields over over or over the the corn belt and certainly an increase in the in the volatility which of is yield. going to make the price go up yeah, even, even more. more yeah so what what we've been interested in is the year to year swings in price how that that price volatility how much it changes from one year to the next and really these kinds of severe heat events that we're seeing now increase the volatility because when you have a a low production year then that causes the price to go up and then if there's a better year the next year than than price. But fall but then you add the the, the requirements about ethanol yep. about the usage a percentage of corn has Must to be go, used for right. ethanol right that has an effect as well. Yeah so that was that was a major focus of our study that we published this spring was trying to understand how uh, how that ethanol mandate plays a role if it plays a role at all and what we found is that because uh, there's a volume of of ethanol that needs to be blended every year by government mandate right uh, that that pulls supply you know out of the food market essentially wow. so right now about 40 percent of the u.s corn production is going into uh ethanol uh into the into is the it energy that market. much yeah really yeah it is and that's been you know that's been over the last you know uh decade or so maybe a little more uh for that since that mandate has been in place right so that that's been a, a very steep ramp up in in uh, the amount of our of our corn production that's going into ethanol, and we're not, you know, my co-authors and I, we're not arguing what's good and what's bad, but certainly, well, by we will. seems like, seems we like will. things Don't are worry. going in, in the wrong direction on both ends. But hey, listen, we got to take a quick break. Um, thank you for being with us this morning. I appreciate it very much, and uh, I've enjoyed reading some of the stuff that you've been writing. I've got a link up to your article and your story from my page. So thanks for being on the show this morning. My pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. You take no care problem. and have a good weekend. Yeah. That was Thanks Professor that Noah Diffenbaugh. Yeah, well, that uplifting it, news. You know, right he, now he's not, he doesn't have a political agenda. It just is what it is.